Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. This is Liam Sanyo from Inside Scientific, and I'm pleased to be your host and moderator for today's event, which is titled The Wonderful World of Scanning Electrochemical Microscopy. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to be joined by Janine Musral, Professor of Chemistry at McGill University and Head of the Laboratory for Electrochemical Reactive Imaging and Detection of Biological Systems. Today, Professor Musral will discuss the fundamentals critical experimental parameters and recent applications for scanning electrochemical microscopy, or SECM for short. Uh, and with that, I'm very pleased to introduce the speaker, uh, Dr. Janine Maserol. Janine, thanks so much for joining us today, and feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Janine. Thanks for answering the poll because it's it's really useful. Uh, for me to gauge uh, the level um, of the talk. And I'd like to let you know that um, there's a question and answer chat. Uh, so um, if you do have specific questions during the talk, please put them there. I'll be answering all the questions uh, that I have tomorrow. And so you'll be sure to have a response. So please don't be shy um, if you have any questions at all. So, um, like, thank you, Liam, for the kind invitation and for uh, organizing the, the webinar, Jamie, Frank, and Mareke. It's uh, really appreciated. Um, so let's get started. And I always start uh, by acknowledgments, because as many people know, no, none of the great science that we do actually occurs um, without a wonderful team. And so um, I'd like to acknowledge all my current lab members, uh, which are on top, and my past group members that have in some way contributed to some of the um, topics that we'll be discussing today. Without them, uh, nothing would be happening in our group. So today is all about scanning electrochemical microscopy. And we see on the left-hand side uh, in blue, a micro pipette tip who's basically playing ping pong with a surface using a redox probe highlighted in uh, red and green. And so this redox probe in scanning electrochemical microscopy gets oxidized or reduced at the surface and then diffuses back to the microelectrode where it will uh, exchange electrons and generate a, a current, which would, we will be monitoring. So on this slide, I'm trying to showcase that there are different types of modes of SCCM. If we look in panel A, on the top, you have the microelectrode and you see R and O, which are our redox species and solution. The R demonstrate that there is a hemispherical diffusion of the species to the electrode surface. And, um, and so therefore scanning electrochemical microscopy is, is uh, highly influenced by how fast species move in a particular media, but also how fast that electron, which you see in the dark portion of the microelectrode gets transferred. And so when um, the microelectrode is very far away from solution, we have hemispherical diffusion. And when we decide to approach the microelectrode to a surface, which is highlighted in, in gray, we see that this uh, the diffusion of the species to the microelectrode surface is uh, sometimes hindered in panel B by the physical presence of the substrate. Or in C, it can be influenced by how fast that electron transfer occurs between species O and R at the substrate, which is in gray. And we can see that you can also collect a species that's formed at a surface in D. Um, you can compete with the consumption of a species in solution, which is called redox competition mode in F. And you have modes also that, that, that don't necessarily monitor the, the current. As I said, the, you have modes that involve the use of ion selective electrodes, which are called, which is uh, presented in panel H 
as the potentiometric mode. So the point of this slide is to show you that in fact, the CCM is quite versatile and you can apply it to a wide variety of uh, situations where your uh, substrate is, is reacting or generating a species of interest. Now, for those of us who love uh, instruments, let me just uh, briefly mention what the instrumental setup of an SCCM look, looks like. At the bottom center, you see that we have uh, a working electrode, a microelectrode, uh, which uh, is where all the action is going to occur. We have a reference electrode and a counter electrode and a second working electrode, which oftentimes is the substrate. Although it could be connected to a bipotentiostat, and actually we can use the bipotentiostat to apply a potential or a current uh, at the substrate, it doesn't necessarily need to be poised for SCCM to work. So that's the electrochemical part of the system. And then uh, one of the key features of scanning electrochemical microscopy is the fact that you can acquire uh, reactive imaging of the surface. By rastering that microelectrode across the surface using um, high positioning motors. Now in, in some systems, you can also have uh, additional distance controllers like a shear force controller, for example, that consistently monitors the tip to substrate distance if your objective is to perform a measurement at a constant distance. And there are several different types of ways by which you can keep a constant distance. Many people are actually uh, professionals at building their own instruments. So I'm just trying to provide you with one example of how an SCCM microscope um, works. So fundamentally, our, uh, my SCCM is monitoring the ping pong match between the redox mediator in solution and the surface, as you see in the animation on the left. And what we're measuring is the current, and that is related to the rate of the electrochemical reaction that's occurring in solution. And, um, and so if we think about it a little bit more by controlling the applied potential either at the microelectrode or at the underlying substrate, what we're effectively doing is controlling the delta G of the reaction using the applied potential, making it more or less favorable, which is what I'm trying to uh, demonstrate here in the red curve that now has a more favorable uh, delta G in order for the reaction to occur. So, what do we need to know to quantify the current that we are going to be measuring at the microelectrode? Well, we need to know two things. We need to know what is the rate of electron transfer at the microelectrode and at the substrate and the rate of mass transport, how fast that red and blue ball are actually taking to um, diffuse or migrate in between this cleft. In order to um, understand this, many researchers that use SCCM will rely on uh, numerical simulation. When they want to understand something about the heterogeneous electron transfer rate that's occurring at the working electrode, they'll be using the Butler-Volmer relationship, which you have on slide 14. Um, and which is a classical expression in, in electrochemistry. So they'll use this expression in order to understand the electron transfer rate that's occurring. And then to understand how species are moving in solution, well, they'll be using relationships like the nernst planck mass transport. And here you see on the right-hand side that the electrolyte is green, highlighting that the species that are moving in, in this electrolyte, uh, in this case, uh, either through diffusion or through migration. 
So in order to have a quantitative understanding of uh, the current, we need to combine these expressions uh, related to the electrokinetics and related to the mass transport in the electrolyte. And the tool that many people use uh, is based on finite element modeling. So in panel one on the top left hand side, I'm showing you a typical geometry that we use uh, to start off our simulations. You see that you have the microelectrode on top. You have a species that's undergoing an electrochemical process from O to R at a certain rate. You have the electrolyte in which you will have concentration profiles. And you have the substrate in gray that will also have a certain rate at which the reaction R to O is going to occur. Once you've identified which uh, boundaries uh, will uh, have a mass transport component or uh, will be subject to electrode kinetics, then you go in panel two where you will mesh that in solution environment. So you will define small boxes that can be triangular or uh, rectangular in geometry, and you will solve the equations discreetly in these elements. Doing Once you've solved them, then we see on panel three on the lower left-hand side, you can obtain concentration profiles close to the electrode surface or close to the substrate if you would like. Once you have access to these concentration profiles, you can then reproduce the approach curves, which are presented in panel four on the lower right hand side. An approach curve is a type of SCCM measurement that we carry out when we approach the micro electrode in a direction normal to the surface that we're trying to study. So that's why on the y-axis, you have the normalized current. That's the current measured at the microelectrode with respect to the current that you would have measured when the microelectrode is in the bulk solution, very far away from the substrate. And on the x-axis, you have the normalized distance, which represents the tip to substrate distance. And it's normalized by typically the radius of the microelectrode that you use. So you see that at a distance of three, we are much further away from the surface. And as we approach the microelectrode towards one and zero, we, we see contrast in the current that we measure. And that's what I want to discuss with you a little bit further. But the point of the this slide is to tell you that if your objective is to quantify kinetics or the reactivity of your underlying surface, it's uh, usually not enough in SCCM to just carry out the experiment. You also have to develop models in order to fit approach curves to extract the parameters. So here we have a summary slide where you have the normalized electrode current, NIT, and that normalized current, which we will be simulating or measuring experimentally, is going to be a function of several parameters, including L, that's that tip to substrate distance, which you see on the uh, lower uh, left-hand side, RG, is an important parameter in SCCM. It's the um, uh, normalized ratio between the RG of the insulating sheet and the radius of the active portion of that microelectrode. And so this is where we see that um, being able to characterize and know uh, what the uh, RG of the probes that you are using, that's really important if your objective is to do quantitative SCCM because you will need to include it in your model. And kappa, that's related to the kinetics of the underlying surface. So if we want to recap the behavior that we can observe during 
typical SCCM experiments, if we approach a microelectrode to an insulating surface, piece of plastic, uh, a piece of glass, a surface that's covered with a non-conductive protein, then as the tip to substrate distance decreases, we will progressively measure a decrease in the current at our microelectrode because the insulator is physically blocking the hemispherical diffusion of the species in solution. And that we call true negative feedback, where the response is really governed by hindered diffusion and physical presence of the substrate. If we have a conductor, a piece of gold, a piece of platinum, a piece of uh, carbon that's well poised, when we decrease the tip to substrate distance, yes, we will still have hindered diffusion by the physical presence of the conductor, but it will be outweighed by the additional flux that's coming because of the reaction at the conductor surface which is why as we decrease the tip to substrate distance, the, the red curve becomes progressively higher. And that's what we call positive and negative feedback. This is the most contrast that you can think to have in SCCM. Now the imaging component of SCCM comes in when you choose to select a certain tip to substrate distance highlighted in the dash line and then raster that microelectrode across the xy plane of your substrate and when you do this it's possible to for you to pick up contrast in terms of reactivity of the surface and then you end up having sccm images across the xy plane where in the middle, for example, I would have a hot feature where the current would be much higher in red, around 100 picoamps. And if it's surrounded by an insulator, the current would be much lower. One thing you can notice is that SCCM images will never be able to reach the lateral resolution that you can expect to have using other scanning probe methods like AFM or um, STM. It, it, the process that's going on here is based on diffusion, uh, which in a way is blurring the reactivity of the feature. So the advantage of SCCM is that you can directly measure the flux, but the lateral resolution, uh, unless you decide to combine your SCCM with an AFM, which uh, there are several groups in the world that are, are really good at doing this, it will be hard to have a lateral uh, resolution with normal commercial instruments that can compete with AFM and STM. And so we have in green and red our feedback contrast. And if our underlying surface has intermediate kinetics, then we will get a family of curves in blue. And this is uh, when we would want to fit the experimental approach curves and try to extract the kinetics of the underlying surface. So from this discussion, one uh, key thing that um, comes out is that microelectrodes are really important. And knowing the geometry of your electrode and being able to reproducibly produce microelectrodes uh, is key. Uh, there are many types of probes. You see on the top uh, part of the slide in a, B, C, E, uh, that you can have a disc geometry electrode. In this case, it's a platinum. Uh, you can have uh, nanometer sized electrodes, uh, which are obtained uh, using a laser pulling procedure. You can have hemispherical uh, electrodes. In this case, it was the um, mercury deposited uh, hemisphere in panel C. And you can also have ring electrodes that are built around classical electrophysiology uh, type uh, uh, pipettes. Also, as SCCM has progressed, multifunctional probes have started to emerge, being able uh, to combine the two, the two different detection schemes, 
uh, and you see on um, the the combination of AFM SCCM, uh, the use of uh, dual uh, platinum and carbon probes, um, and so there's there's a lot of work and research in SCCM related to the fabrication of the probes, and there are very few of them that are uh, commercially available. Typically, the ones that are commercially available will be the ones that you see in the top. Uh, left-hand side panel in A, disc type electrodes are usually commercially available and their size are uh, between 25 micron all the way down to one micron, but uh, very few uh, commercial probes uh, are sold uh, below these types of uh, dimensions. If we look at the application field of SCCM, we see in black that the, the kinetics of surfaces has, has been really well studied. In pale blue, biology has been uh, studied a great, uh, to a great extent. In dark blue, we have instrumental development, the hyphenation of SCCM with AFM, with the fluorescence microscopy, with Raman. Um, it, it's really ongoing. Corrosion field has been using the SCCM. Uh, now, progressively, more and more, the energy field as well, and all um, uh, manufacturing uh, type of surface modification can also benefit from SCCM in terms of identifying porosity or defects in surface coatings. So um, we're now pretty much like halfway through the webinar. The, this was the portion where I was trying to uh, present some of the principles. If you have questions, please let me know. So now I'll, I'll, I'll try to showcase uh, three short stories to uh, demonstrate the application uh, field and the, the type of research you could do. I won't go in great details. It's just to, to give you an idea of how you could use these methods, uh, maybe perhaps in your work. So uh, in our group, uh, one thing that uh, really interested us uh, was uh, to use SCCM to monitor the flux of species coming from cancer cells. Now, if you uh, on the left-hand side, you have a normal uh, cell. In this case, uh, for this work, we were using HeLa cells. And on the cell membrane of uh, all cells, you have uh, transmembrane proteins that are there um, to detoxify your body, and they're highlighted in purple. Now, um, when uh, a person has cancer and is exposed to large uh, amounts of chemotherapeutics for uh, a large time here highlighted in green, what happens is that the um, l expression level of these transmembrane uh, pumps in, in purple is increased and uh, you develop the phenotype of multidrug resistance, which means that uh, the chemotherapeutic agent is more easily exported out of the cell and therefore less likely to have the desired effect. So we wanted to see if SCCM could be used uh, to monitor the functional activity of these transmembrane proteins, and so we drug-challenged the cells. We drug-challenged cells that were not resistant on the left-hand side and cells that were resistant. So we generated a population of cells that had different uh, MDR phenotype. Next, uh, our, the, as we discussed, SCCM is a surface-based technique, and so many people that work with uh, live cells uh, rely on a soft uh, type lithography uh, strategy where they will be able to pattern uh, their cells. In this case, I'm showing you um, the protocol that we use in our labs, but there are people that also use uh, my conical vials or conical um, uh, miniaturized dishes. And so um, th th there's a lot of uh, activity in this field as well. So you pattern the cells. And then what we did is we used uh, two redox mediators to uh, acquire images. On the left-hand side in panel A, the orange ball is ferrocene methanol, which once oxidized to the ferrocinium ion can react with glutathione, which is a, the green ball that's being exported out of this transmembrane pump. 
And so here you we, you're going to have an SCCM response that depends on the functional activity of that MRP1 pump. Now, um, cells have a huge topography. And so if you don't have a distance controller, like a shear force controller, you need an alternate scheme to decouple the response, the functional response of the pump that you're trying to look at from the overall topography of the cell. And so using the pink ball, the examin ruthenium chloride uh, reduction at the microelectrode generates species that are highly charged. And as long as your cell is living and that the cell membrane integrity is not compromised, then you're able to use this probe as a topographical tool. And by subtracting the topography from uh, the reactivity, you're basically carrying out two uh, images, one after the other. One in ferrocene methanol, then you change the liquid and you do uh, one in examine ruthenium chloride. You're then able to extract a kind of a kinetic map. And then you can uh, um, imagine changing many different types of um, uh, experimental parameters. In, in this case, I'm showing you um, how the activity of the cell was affected by the pattern size in um, pattern size that are not well suited where, where the cell cannot adhere properly, like in the ones uh, for 30 and 50 microns, you see large red areas, meaning that the cancer cells are highly stressed and unhappy. You can carry out time-lapse imaging by um, exposing your cancer cells uh, to different chemical species and then monitoring uh, their um, uh, oxidative stress or their response or their, their, their um, cell death as well. And you can also look at the different uh, cell populations that I was mentioning that were particularly targeting MRP1 uh, phenotype and uh, get an idea of how much more active uh, um, uh, certain cells are and try to relate the functional activity that you measure in the CCM with the expression level. So that's what that that was the example for cancer. Let me now switch gears and talk to you a little bit about how SCCM can be used um, for batteries. And in this uh, case, uh, we will slightly change the experimental setup that we've been discussing up to now. Um, there are many ways by which SCCM can be used to study uh, energy materials. You, you can apply them to uh, entire cathode or anode films. You can evaluate uh, the, the effect of uh, film porosity using SCCM. But you can also answer questions like, are all battery particles created equal? The, and that's because the, of the high resolution capabilities of the method. So in this case, Here's the experimental setup if you want to look at very small uh, battery material aggregates. Rather than using the classical microelectrode that we discussed in the, in the previous story, here would be using a, a, a hollow micropipette, uh, which is filled with uh, an electrolyte. Now, if you want to do battery material, this type of electrolyte in, in, in the work that I'll be showing you is, is an organic electrolyte, like uh, propylene carbonate. And then uh, you can form a small droplet at the end of this micropipette and uh, basically um, isolate uh, single battery particles or aggregates and look at intercalation reactions, for example. So the principle behind the method is that you have this hanging drop at the end of your pipette, and you bring it on a surface, carry out your electrochemical process, and then you can move it along the surface. And uh, with the SCCM, you, you, mon by monitoring the current, you can set a threshold at which will help you to land the micropipette on the surface. And this is the second panel on the right-hand side. Once you land, you can carry out a voltammogram, a galvanostatic experiment, coulometry, whatever you would normally be able to carry out with a potentiostat. So 
This is really interesting because you control very precisely the time of exposition of your surface to the electrolyte. It's not that critical for the battery work that I'm discussing here, but it's definitely important in terms of corrosion studies, which we'll talk about later on. So it allows you to uh, perform large matrix scans over millimeter scale um, and uh, acquire an enormous amount of data. Uh, and in this case, because it was a battery work, of course, the entire system had to be put under an anaerobic condition in a glove box. And um, it's pretty doable. You see on the left-hand side, the, the, the glove box and in the zoomed in area, you can see the small micro pipette and the substrate where the battery particle was, uh, were basically dispersed. I would say um, it's um, the, the hardest part of this type of experiment is learning to work with such delicate electrodes using the glove box gloves. Uh, but uh, it's, there, there's very few experiments you can carry out with an aqueous electrolytes for batteries. So if your field is battery research and you're thinking about uh, doing such measurements, you have to think about putting the entire system in a glove box. So here I'm just putting up again our scheme where we have, in this case, the battery particle that we're going to be looking at is going to be LFP in black. We're going to be looking at the intercalation reaction in uh, lithium perchlorate and propylene carbonate. So each of these CVs were recorded in this small drop that was landed on the, on the gold surface where the LFP particles were uh, dispersed. And uh, in this case, we're just changing the, the scan rate, but you can clearly see that we can monitor the intercalation reaction that's occurring. And the nice thing about this technique is that um, there is a residual solvent trace that is left once the meniscus is removed from the surface. And at the end of the experiment, it's entirely possible to take your sample and uh, take it to the, an electron microscope, find the exact location where this measurement was made, and uh, perform uh, uh, EDX, uh, chemical analysis on the exact surfaces or count the number of particles that were within the wetted area. One of the reasons why um, we ended up choosing voltammetry rather than galvanostatic type of measurements is because we are going to acquire an enormous amount of data and it's much easier to automate uh, data treatment algorithms using peaks. And so with the CVs, it's easy for us to be able to automatically extract the peak, po the, the potential of the forward peak or the current of the forward peak. And uh, it's also possible to uh, carry out um, and extract the charge uh, using the CV. So here on the left hand side, you have a high resolution stitched SEM image where LFP particles, which are the whiter uh, uh, aggregates are dispersed. Each of the areas where we landed the uh, micro droplet is highlighted by the circle and the color of the circle in this case is the current of the forward peak for the uh, intercalation reaction. You can then uh, get really nice statistics. You can see that like a larger cross-sectional area correlates to higher peak current and increased charge, uh, but uh, you can generate a lot of data uh, and evaluate a large number of battery particles using this method. In this case, one thing that uh, we were able to uh, provide in terms of information is um, how in, for a certain battery uh, LFP batch, 67% uh, of the battery particles that we had measured uh, had an ideal electrochemical behavior. 27% uh, and 6% uh, had an altered electrochemical behavior, which uh, basically meant that not all battery particles in this batch were created equally. And when we carried out further analysis using uh, electron microscopy, uh, 
uh, it was revealed that for these particular uh, battery particles, in fact, the, the carbon coding uh, on the LFP particle wasn't uniform. And uh, the ones that had the double peak and the shifted peak uh, were not coded properly. So this is the summary for the um, uh, story related to the batteries, where you can see that you can probe the localized electroactivity of battery active materials. Uh, here I gave you an example for LFP, but we've also done NMC. You can change the organic electrolyte from propylene carbonate to a mixture or even to ionic uh, liquids. And, um, and you can uh, basically uh, study a, a large volume of battery particles. Uh, additionally, you can think about uh, using SCCM um, in, in, in an SCCM instrument can also be used as a scanning ion conductance measurement where you're basically looking at the changes in uh, resistance. And if you choose to do this type of measurement, information that you can gain from it can be related to the, for example, the, the porosity of a cathode. So here you have a, a porous LFP cathode uh, that was uh, produced in, in a normal way for coin, coin cells. And you can see that by carrying out similar type of approach curves, as we discussed previously uh, for the, the cancer cells, but in this case, we're, we're looking at the ionic um, conductance in solution, we can extract the film, the conductivity of the film and compare it to that in solution. So. Um, I, I say in recent years, more people have been trying to look at porous um, anodes and cathodes, um, whereas all the previous substrates that we had discussed were, were pretty solid. They, ha they had almost no porosity. All right, so now switching gear for my third story, uh, it's to demonstrate uh, how SCCM can be used in terms of uh, cor in the corrosion field. Now. If you've ever worked in the corrosion field, you know that uh, alloys cannot be considered as a uniform substrate, just like a, a piece of, of platinum or gold. In fact, they have a lot of inclusions which um, end up being uh, corrosion inhibitors. Here you have a stainless steel 444 in the top panel that has these cubic inclusions. And these uh, cubic inclusions ended up uh, being the corrosion initiation site in this type of alloy. And uh, industrial companies are very interested in knowing, well, how, like, how detrimental are they? And SCCM can be quite good at providing a number. So in panel A, because the uh, inclusion was cubic, we ended up uh, developing a, a finite element uh, method modeling uh, for this. On panel B, you see you have the microelectrode, uh, and at the bottom you have a, the inclusion in light gray that's embedded in the dark passive film, and the, the rate at which the electron transfer is going to occur at the inclusion site or the passive film is not going to be the same. And so we should be able to uh, observe this contrast by carrying out uh, approach curves. So in panel C, we have our normalized current, uh, uh, that's coming from the current of our mediator and our normalized distance. And you see the green and the red curves are uh, the positive and negative feedback, the, the, the highest possible uh, contrast that we could get. And the intermediate curves end up being uh, the passive film and the um, approach curve recorded on top of a inclusion. And by fitting the approach curve to the numerical models, we can actually extract uh, the uh, heterogeneous kinetics for the inclusion versus the passive film. And one thing that's really interesting to see in the purple line is that the passive film, in fact, is not totally insulating. There is some reactivity because of the porosity of that passive film that leads to the regeneration of the mediator. So, um, uh, that's a, a, a nice example uh, about how SCCM can be used to study a broad range of uh, corrosion alloys and, and focus on the impact of the inclusions in these alloys. 
Now, another um, industrial process related to, to alloys involves HVOF thermal spray coatings. This is when uh, a, an industrial wants to protect a, an alloy further uh, by um, uh, forming a dense stainless steel, for example, film. In this case, uh, you have an HVOF gun that combines oxygen and kerosene, and you introduce a powder carrier gas, which um, upon heating melts the particles and then forms really, really dense splats onto the surface that you're trying to protect. And in fact, this is a really large industrial uh, process that is used in aerospace, uh, aeronautics, um, and, and yet there, there are corrosion problems that exist with these coatings. If you look at here, you have a, a polarization curve. Uh, the black line is for the base stainless steel sheet. Okay? And you see that when you have the HVOF coated surface, the corrosion behavior is awful compared to the base material, even though the powder that was used uh, was, was a supposedly um, equivalent in nature. So SCCM can be used in, in a similar way as I just presented before, carrying out uh, approach curves on the coded samples. In green, you see the HVOF coding response versus the bulk passive film, which is in the solid red line. And clearly, the HVOF coated substrate is much more reactive. So just from a, a quick experiment, this type of experiment can take like two minutes to acquire, to rapidly know whether or not the coating is doing its job and has a similar corrosion behavior to that of the bulk metal. In the end, we had to analyze single particles that were used in the HVOF um, process using the same type of methodology that I described for the batteries, where we just approached the pipette and carried out local PDP curves. And you can see in red in the D panel that in fact, the source of the problem was not the coating itself, but the generation of the powder that inherently did not have the same corrosion resistance as the base metal. And so I, uh, this type of story highlights that you can use the same instrument at many different scales, right? Like small stainless steel particle scale all the way up to big coatings. And the last example that I'll give you is a method uh, that we recently developed, which is called the oil immersed scanning micro pipette contact method. Now, one of the problems in having these small droplets is that uh, you can have evaporation. And when you want to uh, study alloys, it could take a long time to acquire the data. So it's really important that the droplet uh, remains stable over hours, especially if you want to scan a large surface. And one thing uh, that uh, we realized is that if we cover the surface with a thin layer of oil, we get a much better performance in terms of background noise. So in the black trace, you see the, the noise was um, on, on average 2.2 pico, pico amps in air. And uh, if you had to humidify the, the cell in order to remove um, evaporation problems, this, the noise was really significant. But under the mineral oil, you had only 1.35 pico amps of noise. And so covering the corroding surface that you're trying to measure with a thin layer of oil really is going to help you get better signal to noise. And um, what happened, what's interesting about this method is that it's, it really can perform many measurements over a large scale. Here you have an aluminum alloy, which we imaged. I think it, it, it had something like a thousand landings. Each of the dark area circles on the upper left-hand side is a region where a droplet landed and measured either the corrosion current or a potential dynamic corrosion curve. You can see that the dark inclusions uh, 
um, uh, on the aluminum alloys actually show different uh, corrosion potential on the top right hand corner map the the areas in yellow have a very different corrosion potential compared to the rest of the aluminum matrix and so this type of measurement can rapidly identify what feature is going to lead to corrosion initiation or be uh, subject to microgalvanic uh, coupling which is also detrimental if you zoom in you can see too the uh, our ability like in 608 that's the the yellow line and 610 is the metal matrix and you can see that the iron rich inclusions which are in yellow exhibit a cathodic behavior relative to the aluminum matrix and so what what that tells you in, in a kind of measurement like this is that the surrounding um, uh, aluminum matrix is going to be consumed as the anode in and there is going to be a galvanic couple with the inclusion it's also possible to uh, carry out a very similar type of map and then measure the corrosion current, for example, locally. Um, for, uh, and these experiments take a very long time, several hours, and yet the droplet is completely stable simply by putting a small uh, oil layer on top of the alloy prior to the measurement. Here you can see another example where uh, we carried out uh, complete potential dynamic curves at, on several areas. Uh, 29 and 12 are the, the aluminum matrix and 30 and 13 are the actual inclusions. And so it's, it's possible based on these measurements to identify um, which part of your alloy is going to be more susceptible to corrosion. So the conclusion is that uh, the, the oil immersed version of uh, SMCM is really nice because it allows you to use high evaporative electrolytes. Like uh, in the pipette for the measurements I just showed, it was 3.5 weight percent NaCl, which is the typical standard in a corrosion measurement. And so using these high evaporative electrolyte solutions without the oil, would lead to droplet evaporation normally and crystallization at the end of the pipette. But because of the oil, we can avoid this. And it allows for really long time stability maps. And um, so we, we really like this new application. And if you're interested in corrosion um, and, and you, you need to scan large areas, it's, it's a really viable option. So with this, uh, I will finish again with the acknowledgements uh, for uh, the, the team that has worked on, on these studies. I wish uh, we'd, we'd all be sitting in a room, but we can't. So thank you so much for actually uh, attending the webinar. If you have uh, questions, please put them in the Q&A section and I will make sure to, to try to answer it to the best of my abilities. And final thoughts, I, today I talked to you about corrosion, cancer cells, and batteries, but SCCM can also be used in spectroelectrochemistry, catalysis, biofilm, enzyme films, polarine films. It's a really versatile method. Um, and it, it's also easy to modify the instruments to evolve over time. So thank you very much. And thank you for, to all the uh, funding agencies uh, that have made a lot of the work possible that I presented today. Thank you. And thank you, Jeanine, for a really fantastic presentation. And yes, we mo will move on to the Q&A session. So the first question here, um, what are the similarities to SVET? So I think that's scanning vibrating uh, electrode technique. Yes, the so SVET uh, measures uh, the um, first of all it's oscillating, right? And uh, it also measures the the difference. Uh, it sometimes has two wires, um, and and SVET is also very useful in corrosion. So I would say it's like a complementary uh, technique. Like most uh, SCCM instruments, could be adapted to uh, do SVET as well. Uh, it wouldn't be that difficult. I'd say that the ZVET probes uh, 
uh, are less developed than SCCM probes uh, at the moment. Uh, they they tend to be much bigger. Uh, hundreds. Uh, the the entire tip is is usually around a hundred micron. So that means your lateral resolution won't be that good. So I would say maybe you can't do the the inclusion. But if your objective was, for example, to measure galvanic corrosion between two dissimilar metals, a SVET could be quite good. Excellent. Thanks, Janine. Um, next question here. How can I measure the behavior of uh, lithium batteries, uh, uh, specifically electrochemical reactions using SECM? So yeah, you can, for example, uh, use the, the second story that uh, I, I told uh, was related to monitoring the intercalation reaction, uh, but you can also use SCCM uh, to measure um, the porosity of the, of the anode and, and evaluate um, how, um, well, how much the mass transport is is limiting uh, is limiting in in the cathode so i would say for you can also i think there, there's also a nice group in in germany that's that, that used sccm to monitor dendrite growth at um at lithium uh, electrodes uh, and so um I, I'll, I'll have your question and i can suggest a couple of papers specifically uh, for uh, battery materials, if you're interested. Excellent. Thanks, Janine. Um, next question here from Daria, who's asked, is it possible to image the concentration of the ions involved in corrosion and to distinguish between their oxidation states needed for the corrosion mechanism? Yeah. Uh, could you read it one more time to make sure I'm answering the question correctly? Sure. Uh, so she'd like to know if it's possible to image the concentration of the ions involved in corrosion and to distinguish between their oxidation states necessary for the corrosion mechanism. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, the, in our group, uh, we've developed uh, some uh, magnesium selective ions, uh, el ion selective electrodes. So when, when people want to detect a, a particular ion like magnesium or aluminum three plus they, they'll um, they'll make an ion selective electrode and that electrode is sensitive to the activity of the ion in solution and so uh, they, there are reports on this now in terms of your the the oxidation state uh, usually ion selective electrodes are based on a principle like they'll use crown ethers or molecules that will capture the ion and so uh, <coughs> I apologize if the ion changes charge uh, it uh, may need another molecule to capture it um, and so unless you can directly uh, electrochemically react the ion at the microelectrode uh, surface um, you could plate it uh, as well if um, and and so uh, other options too is to um, use micro pipettes in combination with icp oes inductively coupled uh, optical emission spectrometry um, and so there it's it's not sccm per se but you you're you're collecting the the solution and sending it to the icp afterwards so it, it's a complicated question um, and it requires the development of a specialized probe for you to do it. Excellent, uh, great answer. Um, question here from Daniel who said, uh, thank you Janine for the nice presentation. Have you seen any effect of agglomerated LFP particles versus individual particles from the droplet measurements? Uh, well, so for sure the, um, there, is a, there is a difference. And for um, NMC particles that tend to have larger aggregates, uh, yes, you don't get the same response. Like the current will be different. Excellent. Um, next question here. Um, 
Nagash has said, uh, hello, Professor Masral, that was a very interesting talk. I'm new to the field and would like to know if SECM can be used or has the potential uh, for wet etching nanofabrication in situ uh, using scanning imaging techniques. Uh, do you or your colleagues or collaborators have any similar experience in this field? Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you for attending and thank you for asking a question. Uh, yes, etching, um, etching um, surfaces and, and seeing whether or not the, the etched surface or the, in, in some cases, you know, in microfabrication, you also have like copper deposition. Uh, SCCM has been used in this field. Uh, there are a few papers that I'm uh, aware of in, in the Q&A uh, answers that I'll do tomorrow. I can provide some some uh, reference uh, ideas, but definitely it's possible to use it. Excellent. Thanks, Jeanine. And I think in the interest of time, we'll just uh, ask one more question here. Um, and yes, if there are, there are a bunch of great questions that we haven't had time to address today, but we will be creating a Q&A report uh, that addresses some of them and we'll be distributing it to the full list of registrants for the webinar. So if you still have a question, it's not too late. Uh, feel free to submit it now, and we will pass them all along to Janine for the Q&A report. Um, so last question uh, of the day will be, um, if we want to use SECM using uh, the SGTC mode, how do we know or distinguish the current that we got is the current from SGTC instead of the current from feedback or bulk diffusion? Well, so the... Um... You have, it's the, the, the key in substrate generation tip collection mode is to choose your redox um, reporter molecule really carefully. Uh, for example, um, and make sure that they're not in the same uh, potential regime where they could contribute current. So it's when you start the design of your experiment, uh, let's say, uh, you're going to carry out a reduction um, of oxygen and you're using a, a reporter molecule, well, maybe exa, I mean, ruthenium chloride isn't the best choice because it, it could like overlap uh, with it. Uh, and so it's important to choose your redox indicators uh, correctly because uh, in substrate generation tip collection mode, uh, you'll still want to approach the surface pretty close uh, before you carry out the measurement. You could do this and also change the solution if you want it as well. Uh, that takes more time. So there's lots of strategies by, by which you can do this. Um, and so it, it takes a little bit of experimental design at the beginning, asking yourself, what's the, the standard potential of the mediators? Will there be interference? So you do have to know a little bit about your substrate before you start uh, imaging it. Perfect. Well, uh, thanks so much, Janine, for the really fantastic uh, presentation, also for answering some of the questions with us today. It's been a real pleasure having you with us. Yeah, and I hope all of you are safe. Thank you very much for coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. A big thanks to the audience for joining us today. Um, and I'd also like to give a big thanks to Harvard Bioscience for sponsoring this event and making it all possible. Uh, so in closing, thanks again for taking part in this Inside Scientific webinar, and we look forward to having you with us again soon. Have a wonderful day, everyone.